standing firm with his children at that uh, venue. Also, of course, Femi Kuti, who was complaining very seriously that his father had been struggling since he, Femi, was 13. And at that time, Femi was about 50 years old, meaning that for the past 37 years, it's almost been the same issue. Sorry, I think Pastor has somehow um, gone off, um, but I think he was he's making the point about the video that we watched. So my name is Sonny. I, uh, we are all here on the platform and we're just going to review together this issue that has refused to go away. And the idea is to provide more education for ourselves, a case whether we need to support government or not to remove this subsidy once and for all, if that's what's going to get us to where we need to get to. But if that's going to be the case, what do they need to do first? If there is anything they need to do first before such um, subsidy can be removed. So until pastor comes back, um, we all watched the video and you saw some of the points. And I'm sure we have other the videos that um, we want to create in the back of the So I will allow you to Please put your minds to this. It's alive today. Another video. My second example has to do with a very specific one in my country. The cleanup of the fuel subsidy regime in 2012 during my second stint as finance minister. Nigeria has a fiscally challenging fuel subsidy regime. The country exports crude oil and imports most of its refined needs because its refineries are in very bad shape and provides a subsidy for the sale on the continent to support good public policy. Please put your minds to this problem. It's a lie. Began. Whether they remove the subsidy or not. On the continent to support good public policy. Please put your minds to this problem. It's alive today. My second example has to do with a very specific one in my country. The cleanup of the fuel subsidy regime in 2012 during my second stint as finance minister. Nigeria has a fiscally challenging fuel subsidy regime. The country exports crude oil and imports most of its refined needs because its refineries are in very bad shape and provides a subsidy for the sales of refined oil at the pump. At the end of 2011, a total of 1.3 trillion naira U.S. $11 billion equivalent was submitted as claims for subsidies by 143 marketers who were importing the product. These numbers seemed horrendously large compared to what I had last seen when I was in government in 2006, which was closer to $2 billion in subsidy. So we decided to audit these claims. We audited about $8.4 billion worth of claims, and we found $2.5 billion worth of fraud in these claims, i.e. many of these marketers were trying to claim $2.5 billion fraudulently. With the full backing of the president and the economic team, we decided that we were not going to entertain these claims or to pay. The pressure from the affected marketers was tremendous as we tried not to say, not only to say we would not pay, but also we would clean up the whole mechanism. 
for the subsidy claims and put in place something more transparent, something clearer. This did not go down well with them. When we stuck to our position of non-payment and implementation of the new verification regime, these strong and well-connected vested interests were angered and seemed to blame me personally for this. There were personal consequences. My 83-year-old mother, a retired professor of sociology, was kidnapped by four young men and held for five days. Keeping her wits about her as she was totally terrified, she asked them why she had been kidnapped. And they told her, quote, because your daughter, the finance minister, refused to pay oil marketers their dues. The kidnappers negotiating with my brother demanded my resignation publicly. They, I should go on television publicly and announce my resignation and depart from the country as a condition for my mother's release. Needless to say, these were some of the worst days of my life. Imagine when you are in position, you want your parents, all of whom are here to, with you today and your relatives, to be proud of you. You want to be a source of good for your family. You can imagine how I felt sitting there and thinking, just because of trying to do something right, to implement a good piece bit of policy that was good for the country, this could lead to the taking of my mother's life. These were some of the worst days of my life. With my father's support, the firm resolve of the president, we all decided I should not give in to the blackmailers, and I refused to resign. Following a manhunt, I'm sorry, I still feel emotional when I talk about it. And this story is not really publicly known, so this is probably the first time I'm giving the full details. Following a manhunt for my mother by police and security agencies, she was able to make a dramatic escape after five days in ca captivity where she had only been given water. And half of her sister. Role. So here was a well-justified cleanup and reform of a policy, but implemented in a dangerous reform environment where the losers in the reform, well-entrenched vested interests, decided to fight back to derail implementation. The decision not to resign was a very difficult and risky one. As it turned out, it worked. But there are days I ask myself, on my down days, what if it hadn't? What if they had gone ahead and murdered my mother as she overheard them planning to do with one of their handlers on the phone? Could I have justified trading off firmness on policy and standing up to blackmailers, implementing a good piece of public policy for my mother's life? What decision would you have made? Faculty, what decision would you have made? I know that one other brave hero, a woman I admire so much, a brave activist, and reformer Aung San Suu Kyi was faced with an equally terrible decision. Leave Myanmar to be with her dying husband in England. I'm sure you all know the story. And now what decision would you have made? What decision would you have made? That was the former finance minister, Ngozi Okonjo Iwila, talking of a very personal experience that almost threatened her 83-year-old mother's life just because of this uh, fuel subsidy issue and fuel subsidy manner. And this thing had been going on, according to her, since 2006, 
when she was first finance minister. And at that time, the subsidy or the so-called subsidy was only $2 billion. By the time she was talking, we were talking $11 billion, 11.3 trillion Naira at that exchange rate at the time, which must have been about 100 to one or so. Now at 550 or 560 to one, it's unimaginable the amount of subsidy that we're going through. We're going to play you one or two more quick videos, and then I'm going to ask my friend and my brother, Mr. Olojede, to speak to this issue. As I said, he wants to explain to us, so I'm going to have him explain to us, what really is this fuel subsidy? What is it? And how did it originate? I hope he has the answers to this question. So let's look at this one very quickly. Another the video. government can achieve great things if they aren't so occupied with winning elections only. Subsidized government. The recent announcement by the federal government of Nigeria to increase the price of petrol from 168 naira to 348 naira per liter, despite the already biting hardship, is another sad note in the lifespan of the Buhari administration. I've been a crime Nigerians commit to vote in this government. Apart from the beautiful railway improvement, every other sector in Nigeria of today has deteriorated under this administration, from security, food, economy, forex, name it. Yet, we keep subsidizing the cost of governance as politicians and their associates consistently feed fat on our lean resources. And now, they want to create another opportunity That was Mr. Oshoma speaking on one of the television stations, talking about yet another fuel subsidy regime by the Buhari administration and the biting hardness or the hardness biting, whichever way you want to skin your English of the fuel subsidy. Now let's listen to the Olori Oko himself, Major General Mohamedou Buhari, speak on the issue of wealth subsidy. Back office. Let's go to Buari, please. Well, oil well, subsidy, I, I told you that I've been in petroleum for three and a half times. I don't understand what is a Nigerian economist and the member of the government. Well, oil subsidy, I, I told you that I've been in petroleum for three and a half times. I don't understand what is a Nigerian economist and the member of the government, their definition of that they are subsidizing Nigeria, Nigeria for the oil they are buying. Who is subsidizing who? The Nigerian oil industry, petroleum industry, was developed with Nigerian capital. In fact, most of the expertise are Nigerians, if you go into the field. Is Nigerian capital, is Nigerian oil, what I understand Nigeria should charge Nigerians is the cost of one barrel at the wellhead, and then the cost of transportation to the refinery, the cost of refining it, and its cost at the pump. If anybody said he is subsidizing anything, he is a fraud. So all these people talking about subsidy, who is subsidizing him? But, but there is so much fraud, as I said, and insulin and corruption, that I don't talk about it. But the day I have to talk about it, I will ask the petroleum economists to come and tell me who is subsidizing Nigerians, Nigerian oil. Whose oil is it? We had four refineries with the capacity of 480,000 barrels a day. Let's see if they are good. Because of corruption, they have virtually allowed those refineries 
you know, to become so inefficient that I don't think they produce half their capacity. Now, instead of taking the balance of what to be refined outside, to be refined outside, as we used to, when there's a turn around maintenance when I was in the tunnel, hardly Nigerians know. Because we negotiate with oil companies, we say, okay, Nigeria is using, say, 200,000 barrels a day. Take 200,000 barrels a day. You refine it, you bring the refined product to us. You sell the rest of things we don't need. And then you call the subsidy. Is Nigeria good? We ask them to take a commission for, for what they have refined. But when our refineries, we built three more refineries. It used to be one in Fort Harcourt. We built another one in Fort Harcourt, 150,000. It was over 250,000. We were 100,000. Kaduna, 100,000. And we are, that's supposed to be adequate. Now, even if you are taking 250,000 barrels to be refined outside, all you have to do is to pay the fee for this refining and you bring your own oil and sell it. And people say they are subsidizing. Who are they subsidizing? I don't understand it, and I need the petroleum economist who will explain to me this question of subsidy. It's sheer fraud and corruption. Thank you very much, General Buhari. And it's nice for him to, for us to hear him say that the subsidy is sheer fraud and corruption. And I think that video must have been taken around 2012, 2011, during the Jonathan regime, before he came in in 2015. And here we are, 2021, the sheer fraud and corruption has continued. And now this time under his leadership, 2021, the refineries that were even doing 200,000 barrels a day in those days are no longer working. So in fact, they earn salaries of about eight something billion naira every month and produce nothing. And this one is now under the Buhari regime. And then right now we no longer do any refinery refining at all in Nigeria. Mr. Bolaho Olojede, thank you very much for agreeing to speak to us today. Maybe you are the petroleum economist that General Buhari was looking for on the platform. And you've heard, maybe you were there when Tunde Bakari was speaking, Braithwaite, Ungozi Okonjo Iwala, and Mr. Oshoma. So maybe we found for General Buhari is petroleum economist. So he wants you to explain to him what is this fuel subsidy? How did it begin? What does it mean? And is it fraud or is it not fraud? Over to you, sir. Um, thank you very much, uh, Pastor Itua. Um, I think it's a, a good starting point will be from his own speech. Um, at some point, don't forget that um, it was Minister for Petroleum, uh, 77, 78, I believe. Uh, in fact, he saw to the completion of one of our refineries and apparently signed the contract for another. So he was, um, or he must have been leaning on what was happening in 1978. That was 40 odd years ago. At those times, those refineries were still relatively new. We were refining products. We probably were even exporting to other countries. But like I said, that was over 40 years ago. And uh, he said something, he said, okay, you just pay for uh, the oil from the wellhead, logistics to the refinery, then the refining, and then you distribute. A very major change that has happened in that chain is that there are no refineries anywhere there. So we do not have those refineries, or we have refineries, maybe that's not the right way to put it. We have refineries that are not working. They're not producing anything. So it means we import the fuel that we consume. And this is where the subsidy comes in. Subsidy uh, in, in, in plain terms is when consumers pay less than the market price 
for a good or service that they are consuming. So it means that somebody has paid the difference and that is the subsidy we're talking about. I, I have the privilege of having served at, um, at a senior level uh, in, in oil and gas, one of the oil and gas, indigenous oil and gas companies, which they play both in the upstream and downstream sector uh, of, of oil and gas. I also work with uh, an organization that was managing oil and gas terminals. So on a first hand basis, uh, let me say frankly that there is subsidy or there has been subsidy in in a, in a fuel uh, in, in Nigeria. And, and it is easy to see. When you think about the, 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 the simple market situation is that you import something into the country and you are being asked to sell at a particular price that doesn't leave you any profit. Sometimes it actually goes beyond the cost of that product, definitely someone has to pay for that gap. And that is the subsidy that we are talking about. If you look at refining, the single largest cost element in refining is the crude itself. So let's picture the fact that um, in Nigeria, PMS price is the same when crude is $30 a barrel. It is the same when it is 50, when it is 70, when it is 80. How can it be? Um, it is illogical that price will remain the same. But the reason it has remained the same is that as the price of crude goes up, somebody is paying the difference to, ensure, to make sure that the consumer will not bear that brunt, and that is the subsidy. Um, is it a bad thing? Uh, not exactly a bad thing to have subsidy. But because of the economic distortion that comes from subsidizing consumption, the widely accepted approach is not to subsidize consumption, but to subsidize production. So when you go into a review of the US oil industry, for example, you will be amazed that there are subsidy issues in, in, in the US. But that subsidy is not at the pump. There are several legs in the, in, in the chain from the prospecting to the exploration, to the production, you know, to the refining. So you can plug in subsidies in those, uh, before you get to the consumption level, those ones have more benefits to the economy than when you plug it at the consumption. At the consumption level, what you have done um, is to number one, largely subsidize members of the society who deserve no subsidy. Uh, um, somebody puts uh, three cars on the road every day. Papa, mama, and the children are all there on the road. Some of these cars are filled guzzlers. Uh, they probably take down 10,000 Arab foil in two days, in two and a half days. Uh, that is not the same as the guy who, when he buys 2,000 Naira fuel in his uh, Okada, it can take him for more than a week. Now, I, with the bigger vehicles, I am being, I am a bigger beneficiary of that subsidy regime. That, that, that is one point. Number two is the graft that is involved. There is a huge black, the, the, the subsidy, fuel subsidy in Nigeria is a huge black hole of unaccountability. And I'm saying it with the benefit of someone who, is, who was in that industry. There is so much going on. And by privileged information, you cannot begin to talk about some privileged thing that you, 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 you know about. But I can say emphatically that there is so much corruption that subsidy entails. We have people who will bring in vessels of fuel. They will sell it on, uh, off, off Kotonou, on, you know, offshore Kotonou and still file for subsidy claims in Nigeria. And all the relevant agencies of government will be there to sign those documentation. And it will become an obligation on the federal government of Nigeria for which it has, it has to pay. That is just one of the ways in which this uh, full subsidy has become a major, major source of leakage. But you see, there are huge beneficiaries of the subsidy regime. These people will do anything to ensure that we cannot remove that subsidy. And if what, what um, Ngozi Okonjewela was talking about is an example of what they can, the extent they can go to. 
they kidnapped her mom because she was getting into that space of subsidy. Anything that will say remove that subsidy or don't pay that subsidy any longer, the beneficiaries will do anything to ensure that you cannot pursue that, that, uh, that agenda. From media sponsorship, they can even sponsor protests. They can sponsor uh, uh, labor unrest. They can sponsor anything. And they can go sinister to the extent of kidnap, probably even assassination. I think at some point, Ngozi was asked to, uh, was threatened that if, he doesn't, if she doesn't resign, she will leave that position on a wheelchair. That is how bad the issue of a, of a, of a graft that is involved in full subsidy is concerned. It's also a very difficult thing from a political perspective. During Obasanjo regime, he tried to remove subsidy, uh, you know, at, 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 at the point. He did remove it, but we went back to it. And this is how it works. When the price of oil is low, it's actually a right time that you can fiddle with removing the subsidy. But the problem politicians have is that when the price of crude goes up and you need to recalibrate, you need the, the pump price need to increase accordingly, there is a fear of backlash. Backlash from labor, backlash, loss of political capital is a major one. So no politician wants to dare, nobody wants to go there because if you remove it, the backlash is too much. And we saw that when Jonathan decided to, the, the government of President Jonathan, decided to remove fuel subsidy. We saw that backlash. Massive protests, serious labor unrest, and, 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 and all, all, all of that issues that came with that. Then come to the Buhari regime. Um, when, when he, in, the, in the year leading up to the election, he had told everybody, oh, what is this subsidy? There's nothing like that. But six years after he has become the president, he has not stopped to pay that thing that he said does not exist. Because in reality, it does exist. And removing it comes at a very high cost, a very high political cost. Who would dare to go there? At some point, uh, I, he got persuaded by a former minister of uh, petroleum, I think former GMD, uh, forgotten his name now, the man from Delta State. Kachiku. And he did remove it. Kachiku. 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 That was when price moved to 162, the, the current, around the current price that we are right, maybe 165. But when oil price appreciated and we needed to recalibrate, nobody could confront that monster. So we let it be and we continue to run like that. Until sometimes last year, last about a year ago now, there was this news in the media that, uh, oh, we have now fully deregulated the downstream oil. Uh, uh, in Nigeria, but that was very dishonest because in reality, we did not. And it was easy to see why, um, you know, I, mean, I challenged that particular uh, uh, news, news item then. Number one, we said we fully deregulated, but we still have a, a PEF, that's the Petroleum Equalization Fund, uh, which is meant to equalize the price of oil in the South and in the North and in every part of Nigeria. We still had, PPPRA determining the price at which PMS is to be sold. If you say you deregulate, why do you still have an agency telling us how much to sell the firm? At the same time, we had a situation in which the sole importer of PMS remained PPMC. So if the market is deregulated, why do you have all those constraints? So it was obvious to uh, some segment of the society that there was no deregulation. And of course, about six months down the lane, uh, federal government had to come out to say, look, um, we did not deregulate. And, and those are some dishonesty uh, that came into that space. And, and those, these things do not help matters at all because they erode the trust capital between the government and the governed. And when government now has come back to say, okay, we are ready to do it now, we want to do it, people are saying, why should we trust you? And how are we going to suffer when you remove this. Because we have seen what happened in previous period when you remove this subsidy or when fuel price goes up. When it goes up, it has an implication for transportation, it has an implication for small and medium scale businesses 
that rely on, on, on uh, gasoline power generators. For example, the barbers, uh, the hairdressers, these this are people who use gasoline power generators. So it affect their businesses. And then transportation, public transport was a go up. So people are saying, in the midst of what we are already passing through, how are you going to remove this thing? We also have not spoken to the issue of refineries. Now, before the Dangote refineries, some Nigerians have also obtained refining licenses, but nobody built a refinery. Apart from those little modular refineries that were focused mainly on diesel, because those are diesel is easier to handle. But PMS, you require certain level of technology and sophistication and certain level of capital and skill to, for it to make sense. So nobody was going to PMS at all. And the reason is clear. The reason is because the mathematics of refining did not add up. By the time you finish producing, you won't be able to sell at a market rate. You will be forced to sell at the government rate, which means you will be waiting for subsidy for you to break even. If you are going to be waiting for subsidy before you can refine, then you will not get financing for that kind of a project. So people had licenses all over the place. Nobody built refineries. At the same time, the government refineries were not working. Now, if government refineries were working, that might have helped significantly. But if government refineries are working, it is not in the interest of the subsidy beneficiaries. They will ensure by all means possible that sort of those refineries never got to work. Now, we have a private refinery that is coming up that comes with its own benefit, which is a, uh, 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 the fact that some of the jobs that we have been exporting by virtue of importing PMS into the country can be retained here. As a matter of fact, that refinery might be the single largest uh, employer of labor by the time it finally opens. That also comes with some fear, and that is a fear of a monopoly. Now, when a single company is the provider of the total consumption in a country, uh, that is a monopoly. And the, 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 there is a price control that comes with all, all and another disadvantage that comes with that, which is why it will be a nice thing if the government refineries can also come on stream and complement or challenge or compete with what that uh, 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 private sector refineries will be producing. There is beauty in competition because it helps with pricing matters. And one thing that has happened is that um, I think earlier this year, the federal government has, for the umpteenth time, contracted the revamp of those refineries. I think a couple of those refineries. Again, I've been hearing of this contracting of refineries, I would think, since around uh, 2000. In the, no, not 2000, in the days of Abacha was the town, town, town around maintenance. So, so it must have been like 1998, 1997, that I've been hearing about uh, re, re, this, bringing this refinery back to, on, 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 on speed. In fact, when I was in banking, there was a project we presented that the only reason that project could not be approved by the MCC was because we had this group, uh, managing director of NMPC, who had promised that all the refineries were going to start working. His name was Yaradua, I remember. You know, but till today, those refineries are still not working. Now, how much can we rely on the fact that for the umpteen time, we now have a new award to bring those refineries on stream? Can we be, do we believe that they will start working? For me, as an individual, it's a see don't look matter. Until we see it happen, uh, it's, 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 it's something that is difficult to follow. Should we remove subsidy? 100% so, we need to remove it. But what should we do if we're going to remove subsidy? What are the ways we can handle this to ensure that we are not transiting from fry pan to fire? That is the real question. The real question is not don't remove subsidy. We need to remove subsidy. We need to remove it. It is how do we make that happen such that it will not hurt us and rather it will translate into huge benefit in the medium to long term for Nigerians?
Good. Thank you very, very much for that um, analysis. And I was really, really enjoying it and all that. So um, we're going to show another video briefly as to what we can do and what a nation can do potentially with her oil revenues and so on and so forth uh, in a few minutes, okay? But then let me ask you another question, my dear brother, Bolaon. Um, why is it that Buhari promised or wanted to remove this fuel subsidy until today, he has found it difficult to do so, or what really could he have done to make it possible? Uh, in, in my opinion, I don't even think he understood uh, that space any longer. He had um, a knowledge that was about 35 years old when he was Minister of Petroleum, 77, 78, there about. Uh, during that time, there was no subsidy issues. The refineries were working well. So uh, apparently, he carried that belief into what he was saying, that who is subsidizing who? Just take production from the wellhead and take it to the refinery. Which refineries? There were no refineries. They were not producing anything. You know. So uh, when he came in, the reality must have set in. He had this very strong conviction, though, that uh, uh, anything that affects uh, uh, that will increase the pump price will further impoverish the people. It is, it is, he had that belief. In, in a way, um, I don't think it's a bad thing to think about the poor, to say, oh, don't do that because if you do it, it will further impoverish these people. But for you to stand on that, you need to properly understand the dynamics, the prevailing dynamics of that industry. And that was what Kachiku struggled to persuade him of all through his tenure. In fact, if there's somebody I really pity uh, in his role in this matter, it was, it was Kachiku. Because he knew exactly what the problems were. He knew what we needed to do, uh, but he had a problem with uh, the, the powers that be accepting that we needed to remove that sort look at Look at it. In August in, in, in the US, uh, a, a, liter, a, a liter of fuel on, on the average was about 0 0.93. That's about 93 cents. Come to four months after, it was about uh, 99. So it has moved from an average of about 380 naira to about 405 naira in four months. And that is what you get when you remove subsidy because it is the market price that will recalibrate the price for you. Then what is going on in the market that will recalibrate your price for you. Um, we, uh, how we handle that as, as a nation <laughs> is, uh, is, is something we, are, we, we look forward to seeing. But we've done it in diesel. Um, may, maybe we can as well try it in PMS. I don't think that what Nigeria wants, this, this, this is a personal opinion. I don't believe that what Nigeria wants in the, in the long run is to continue to pay subsidy so that they can have cheap fuel to drive on bad roads. Good, but do you think that the removal of the subsidy will actually have a very serious adverse effect on our economy and uh, affect the well-being of our people and so on and so forth? Do you really think so? Or is it a myth more than a reality and other countries in the world that are not subsidizing their fuel, are they managing? Good. The, in, in the short term, there is a shock to the economy. Um, and it will affect transportation costs. It will affect certain things. So some prices will go up. This short term, I believe, is what, uh, what is bringing up the issue of $5,000 palliative for between 6 to 12 months. Uh, you know, that is what I believe the federal government is trying to kill with that. Whether 5,000 Naira palliative uh, is the right way to go, that's another discussion. But it is that short-term effect that the federal government is trying to kill with that. In the medium term, let's, let's think about this. If we're saying we are spending, there are a few figures out there, one trillion on subsidy in a year. One trillion on subsidy in a year. For the year 2021, as at uh, last month, November, when uh, the Minister for Works was talking, 
the total release, the total capital expenditure release for works and housing was 189 billion. 189. And meanwhile, we have paid 1 trillion in subsidy. It goes without saying that if we have a honest motive and we are committed to translating the subsidy gains into changing our infrastructure space, we can do it. Imagine what will happen to works, the Ministry of Works that has been receiving 189 billion. If we channel, I'm just hypothetically saying, if that, that works ministry now gets a trillion, what will happen? We can easily transform totally the infrastructure space of this country. In fact, we can decide not to go, not to take it to uh, every other department or every other ministry and concentrate on transport infrastructure. Say, because this, let's say transport and power, if we save from subsidy and take these savings and put it in transport and power infrastructure, we can transform that space totally in the medium term. So the problem we have to deal with is how do we handle the short-term shock to the economy, especially to the lower rung of the ladder, who will you know, have to deal with in, in, in increase uh, in, in transport costs and, and other inflationary issues. Let me play a video, maybe to support uh, what you have just said um, about uh, the benefits of actually removing the subsidy and reallocating that resource to infrastructure, especially transport infrastructure. That might even uh, better serve the people than them taking away one trillion uh, and most of it going into the- I don't know how. Go ahead, please. You did this in 50 years. I don't know how you did this in 50 years. You look at history, who does this? Show me anybody else that has done this in 50 years. I'm, I'm waiting, mm -hmm. Let, show them to me. This wasn't done by money. Money, money doesn't produce visions, visions produce money. You've had leadership over here that were visionaries great visionaries and their vision was more about the people than the money because you can't accomplish this in 50 years without loving your people first because the people are the ones that's benefiting from this look at your health care look at your road system look at your highway system look at your airports who does this in 50 years but who benefits you're going to care about those people. It's something to be learned about what's been done over here that could be duplicated in the world because there's people with this much money. You just don't have people with this much love for their people. Well, that is a city that a lot of our leaders go to, their wives go to. In fact, one of the presidential aspirants of Nigeria virtually lives there when he's not politicking. So in fact, the last time I went to this city, Dubai, they said, hey, come and see so -so and so's house. Come and see so -so and so's house. Beautiful house he lives in, in this Dubai. I should come and see it. I said, if the house was in Nigeria, I'd have gone to see it. But if it's in Dubai, I'm not interested, you know, and so on and so forth. Uh, even uh, my good friend, the VP, uh, told me a story of when he flew into Dubai with one of the former governors of one of our states. That time he was in VP. And the guy was marveling, marveling at the beauty of Dubai. And they were sitting together chatting and the guy was excited about Dubai and all that. And he, the VP at the time, was thinking to himself, uh, if you are so marveled by this place called Dubai, why don't you do the same in your state? Uh, and there was no answer for that. And uh, the presenter on this program was saying that this is a product of vision and love, vision and love for the people, vision and love for the people. What do you have to say to that about the leadership that we have in Nigeria right now and the state of our nation? Let me tell you pointedly that anybody who has half a chance is leaving Nigeria. 
And those who are not living because they are probably making money off the system have two passports and are ready to live at the nearest provocation or sign that the whole thing is about to fail. What do you have to say to that? Well, um, it's, it's, it's quite unfortunate uh, where we have uh, brought ourselves. Uh, a friend of mine had uh, called me a couple of days ago to complain about the cold in the part of UK where he is. I mean, he, he very also cold. left. Very, very year. cold. And he, he earlier this year, he left. Place. He left earlier this year. So this is probably his first real winter <laughs> in, that, in that place. <laughs> and he said, by 4.30, it is pitch dark in the UK, you know, uh, the sun has gone out. There are, you could have several days uh, without even seeing the sun and it could be drizzling from morning till night and by 4.30 it is dark. And what I told him was, so does that tell you something about the need for us to make our own country better? So that we give people a choice. The choice is for me to decide whether I want to go and stay at uh, two degrees or minus four degrees, or whether I like my Lagos. The choice to say whether I want my, my, uh, uh, the day not to become darkness until seven o'clock, or whether I'm comfortable with 4.30 p.m. darkness. You know? So, but we have not done that. Um, and, and, and it bothers on, on leadership. There's, um, there's something called the seaward folly. Uh, see what was the American Secretary of State who bought Alaska from the South uh, uh, Russia there. And when he bought it, I think for $7 million or something like that, the transaction was seen as so foolish uh, that how can somebody buy a pack of ice for $7 million? So it, it was coined the Seaward Folly, and it was in that policy for a long time. For some years down the line, when the Cold War had started, you can imagine that Russia had remained the owner of Alaska, which is right at the backyard of the United States. What a calamity that would have been. So leaders are meant to see into the future, take very uncomfortable decisions sometimes, even at the expense of losing political capital. But what we have seen in Nigeria is totally different. People prefer, leaders prefer the routine decisions. Tough decisions are tough. You will, if you will make me lose vote, then I would rather not just go there. Then the capacity to even see into the future for, for a, a, a minister of transport to desire that, oh, by the time I'm leaving this place, I want to be able to ride uh, in a train uh, to, my, to my hometown, you know, or, or for a minister of health to think, okay, by the time this is all over, I should be able to receive my care right here in Nigeria, or even for a president to do that. Because I remember when the current president came and he had to go abroad for medical studies, uh, I mean, for, for healthcare, I was like, yes, there, is, there are no facilities for him. So the, if he was my father, would I say he should die when there are no hospitals? No. So he went, but that was first year. It is now six years. I would have thought that when he came and found the facility in such a state that he would not be able to use them, a vision that that could have birthed in his mind is to say, by the time I leave this place, I want to be able to receive this, my healthcare at my backyard. Just picture it that the president of the US will go to France for healthcare. Or do Can you imagine? Go to Russia for healthcare. It doesn't happen. So these are the real things of national pride, not, not even uh, national career. There's nothing pride about national career. The things of national pride are things like when your president is proud enough to receive his healthcare in his own country. So we need, to do, we need to do a lot more. And one of the places where we can begin to make a difference is in being able to take tough decisions, but be committed to the, to, and be honest about what we're gonna do. So that if they remove, if, if you remember what Bakari was saying, he said, you have already shared this money. They will, they will give Jonathan 400, they will give the state this much, they will give the local government this much. 
Now, that is what can happen in this system. We might be able to save one trillion truly from the subsidy that we are not paying uh, or that the subsidy we have, uh, we, we have taken off the table. But with that one trillion, go into transforming the transport infrastructure and the power infrastructure so that in the medium term, in fact, within a span of one year, we can begin to see a difference in those infrastructure space. Will it happen? Will it not happen? These are the issues of mistrust that is making this subsidy remover a hard sell for the people. They will say, it's, it's better you leave it as it is, so we are, let, let's be enjoying it. as Because by the time you remove it, as soon as we take share the money, we're not going to know. You know, why has Nigeria had the misbenefit, let me use that word, to have consistently produced for herself leaders that have not had this vision and leaders, most of whom have not had this love for Nigeria. I mean, you made a very, very brilliant allegory. If in the first year, Muhammad Obari went to London for medical care, honestly, like you've said, I forgive him. This is what he meant, met when he got there with Jonathan. But if in the sixth year, he's still going to that same London for medical care. And like I said, when I spoke in April, I can assure you that at least a third of his medical personnel will be Nigerians in that medical treatment. There's no way that his anesthetic or his consultant or his nurse or even the cleaner of the hospital will not be a Nigerian who has left Nigeria because of lack of opportunity and taking hold of the system in the UK. Um, I mean, I mean, issue. And now they now say they are voting 8.4 billion to do a 14 bed clinic in Maso Rock. I mean, who does that? I mean, 8.4 billion to do a 14 bed clinic. I mean, I don't know when this will end, my dear brother. Why is it that we have consistently, even us, the voters in Nigeria, those, the electorate, we don't like ourselves, we don't love ourselves. We consistently vote for people who will take us nowhere. Why is that so? Do you have any thinking or any idea? Um, there, there, there are a few things um, I would like to say about uh, this, your, the, your last comment. Uh, number one is in the space of, um, participation in the electoral process. Um, don't let me use Anambra, the last Anambra Guba, because it was an exception. Uh, but we can as well go back to um, presidential election, 2019 presidential election. 2019 presidential election, the total vote by PDP added to APC, added to everybody together, was about 26 million plus. That was what everything was. Uh, in a country where we're being told we are 200 million. Uh, well, uh, nobody knows whether we are 200 million anyway, but it was just about 26 million. That was the total vote. How many people were on that register? About 80 something million registered voters. So 80 something million people out of which only 26 million showed interest to participate in how, who is going to lead them is determined. You might have thought, oh, maybe uh, it's an illiteracy thing. How about Lagos? Even in Lagos state with over 6 million voters, the voters were, the votes were just about 1 million plus. What were the remaining 5 million voters doing on election day? So there is a participation problem, apathy. What is driving this apathy and how we can deal with that is something to consider. That is on one part. On the other part, we have a democracy that we copied and pasted. You go to America, oh, they have a bicameral system, uh, president and all of that, and we brought it there and slam it uh, onto our system. So uh, that included having an overbloated uh, uh, bureaucracy or, or government uh, apparatus that even the revenue, we need to ask ourselves if this is really deserving. Do we need 360 people 
in the national in the in, in the House of Rep and additional one and nine in the Senate to make law. Despite this foreign and something people that were there, it took us 12 years to pass PIB into law. So what exactly um, do we need to revisit this copy and paste democracy and adapt it to the way to suit ourselves? And, and, and I will tell you why. The leadership recruitment process is one of the flaws that is in the system. The way the people we even get to vote for, the way they emerge is a problem. If we take a China example, China, um, I'm not advocating for uh, a China model, but I'm just saying there are things that can be copied from China. The way leaders emerge in China, the, the, the leader of the country emerges in China is such that um, only the best out of the best will emerge as the leader in China. Now, we have not seen that play out in Nigeria. Rather, what we see is only maybe most of the time, the person that some powers that be are foisted on the system are those that we merge as a candidate that we have to vote for. So we must look at certain meritocracy in say a China system that throw up the best of the best. You must have done this, you must have served at the province level. In fact, the provinces are set against one another in China. They set them against one another to force them to compete. So you compete on what you're able to achieve. And so many levels, you must have proven yourself at several levels before you finally become that president. So it, it, the, the, the kind of president that we emerge from a Chinese system can never be the kind of thing that we're producing in, in Nigeria most of the time. So we need to look at the system and see how we can formulate our leadership uh, recruitment system, including our non-politician who also participate in that, which I think a program like this uh, could also help because there are people who are asking themselves, how do I, get to participate in this system. And, and they are not finding the answers uh, on the pages of newspapers. So there has to be some sort of grooming, uh, some sort of uh, platform that could help to bring all this to that and ensure we have a better recruitment uh, of, of, of leaders in Nigeria. Let me ask you one or two more questions and also speak to what my friend Ene Tamuno said on the platform. Uh, he doesn't seem to agree with me that um, uh, it is not Nigeria that has produced its own leaders that somehow, I don't know, maybe he can explain. Uh, we just find ourselves with these leaders. But since 1999, everybody has had an opportunity to participate in the choice of leadership. But one of the issues here is this. A lot of Nigerians don't vote because number one, like my brother said, you have Tweedle D and Tweedle Dom. You have two poor choices. So whether you vote right or vote left, uh, it's almost the same result. That's number one. Number two, a lot of them don't think their votes count. A lot of the time, this thing has already been written, even since 1959. There's this book that, I, that I've been reading, the Harold Smith story, that speaks about how even the British wrote the elections in 1959. They, they maneuvered it, they, they organized it to suit what they wanted to leave behind in Nigeria and not necessarily the will and the interest of the people, even from the census. And then number three, they feel that, um, uh, first of all, number one, uh, and a lot of them don't even know, they can't connect their livelihood, their economy, their state of life with political leadership, they can connect. There's a massive amount of ignorance among a certain class of people uh, in, in Nigeria. Um, so let me ask you two questions. What can we do on this platform? What can we do as average Nigerians to ensure that come 2023, we have the right kind of leaders? Because 2023 is coming. Even the politicians are wringing their hands like this 
and saying, we don't know who will emerge, we don't know what will happen. We don't. In the two parties, oh, they don't know. They're not sitting down at this point to think that who should we bring out in our party, even if it's to win the election, who in this party will make us win the election? We're not even talking about good governance now. Who mm. will make us win the election? And then who will then give us good governance? In They're not even talking, they're waiting for people to show up and emerge and show themselves and present themselves and say, vote for me. Who does that? Mm. No real serious party does that. If you are serious, that you are just waiting that somebody among the party will show up and then you will say, okay, let him come for. No, a party that wants to win an election, people will gather together in the party and say, what is our strategy to win this election? And which one of our leaders is best to put forward to win this uh, election? I'm amazed at the way they are looking, both PDP and APC. And some people are saying, don't even think of a thought force. It can never work. It's too expensive. Nobody will look that way. You can't make it work, blah, 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 blah. Let me pick your brain and ask you, first of all, what do we do to ensure that we don't get faced with bad choices at the end of the day from these two so-called political parties. Number two, what can we do in anticipation of this? And then number three, this so-called third or fourth force, is it impossible? It cannot work? Are we doomed to always be constrained with the choices that APC or PDP give us. And if we're not careful, maybe it's only APC that we'll be faced with in the near future, because PDP just doesn't seem to get his act together. Let me find out from you what you think, and then we'll throw the floor open for a few questions. And then I'll ask you a few final questions on, on fuel subsidy, and we will close. Please go ahead. Okay, um, on what can we do? Uh, one of the things we can do um, is um, in the space of in the space of citizens' education. Um, a platform like this is a very table platform for citizen education. Look, look, look at it this way: um, politicians says, or they try to make you believe that your vote doesn't count, but they are willing to pay for it. Who pays for what doesn't have a value? Why do people carry sacks of money to go and start sharing? Five five thousand to people to buy votes if the vote doesn't count. But when they tell you that your vote doesn't count, you lose interest. You don't even bother to show up, and they are on the winning side when you don't come to that polling booth. I can't hear him. He's muted. You are muted. Okay. Can you unmute yourself? Well, yes, I have, I have now unmuted myself. Uh, okay, maybe I, I need to take what I said again. Um, I said politicians try to tell us that our votes don't count. But they go ahead and start paying for those same votes. They buy them. Who buys what doesn't count? And that is a fundamental question we must ask ourselves. The electoral process, as flawed as it is, has actually gradually improved over the years. There was a time you could literally write those votes and nobody would know anything. You just write anything. Now, as technology is improving, as uh, biometric is getting into the, the place, as we are cleaning up the voters' registers, things are beginning to change. People say, oh, Baseki will not win a do now because the, the ruling party was there. Uh, the, every, you know, everything was against him and he will not but well, he won that election by 70,000, over 70,000 votes. Now, we also saw what happened recently in Anambra. We shouted about electronic transmission of results. It has happened. We protest, I mean, so party members have been also been talking about direct primaries. It appears as if it will also happen. So the electoral process, despite the fact that it is still flawed, has improved dramatically over the years. We should not allow politicians to deceive us that our votes don't count, and therefore we stay off the process. Rather, 
If you're of the voting age, grab your voter's card and be ready to use it. How would that have changed things in the 2019 election? In 2019, the two primary guys were the current president and Elijah Tiku. But there were other candidates. For example, there were people who liked Kinsley Mogalu. And I asked myself, so why didn't you vote for him if you think you like him that much? They said, oh, he cannot win. We know he cannot win. He's either of these two guys that will win the election. He, uh, he has no um, grassroots, uh, no, how do, how do they put it now? He has no structure, no grassroots structure that can deliver the vote. Nigerians must be willing to serve in the space of what they believe. That grassroots that you say a third or fourth force does not have, we can help to build it. Let's go back to that statistics in 2019 presidential election. Total vote 26 million plus, 26 million plus. Voters 80 million. What that shows is that even if APC and PDP took that they are 26 million, there are still 50 million votes that never showed up at the polling booth. And that 50 million is actually capable of delivering a third or a fourth force. And you will just totally ignore the, uh, the, the two big ones. But because there's a mindset that that will never work, everything has to be based on those two major parties which is one thing that normally happens in, in most uh, democracies anyway, nations tend to gravitate towards uh, a, a two-party system. But if these two-party systems are not giving us what we want, we must begin to look at the third force that can deliver. And what will make that happen is participation. We need increased participation in that, in, in that, in that process to be able to deliver a third or a fourth force. Uh, for, for our people. So it is doable. And if we just involve you and I and all of us participating in that process. Well, very good. You just got yourself a job as the campaign manager for the third and the fourth force. So, you are <laughs> going to... <laughs> so I'm going to be calling you because I know one or two people want to do a third and a fourth force. And I'm going to be telling them that I know the man that can get that 50 million votes that is lying idle. And he has the strategy for it. I know you haven't told us everything, and I don't want you to do that on this platform. But I'm going to call you, and you have to get involved. Because part of the problem in Nigeria is that nobody wants to really get involved. They don't want to stick out their neck. Nobody wants to take the risk. Nobody wants to lose their life. Uh, and they keep saying, ah, I have my child, my children, we look after them, blah, blah, blah. You know, you can't get power, you can't get leadership if you don't want to sacrifice. That's one of the things that people do not know, and they're not willing. So the conclusion I came to with a lady that I was speaking to before this platform is that we, the average Nigerian is not really serious. They're not really serious. They're just, they still want to chop up one bed, they still want to get married, they still want to enjoy life. They still want to go to London and come back. They don't want to change Nigeria. But you know, this Nigeria, this Africa, is where the British and everybody else that we're going to look for, we're trying to enter. They were trying to migrate here because of the better environment that is here. It's ironic that we have to beg them and threaten them to leave South Africa. And if not for the mosquito, they wouldn't have left Nigeria. They got to America, they settled there, they didn't go. Got to Australia, they didn't go. Got to Brazil, got to Spain, got to, got to Bahamas, got everywhere, they refused to go. And then we, we, we have a total disregard of a land flowing with milk and honey. Anyway, my good friend, Anthony Ugebo wants to ask you a question. It's a lot of pain for me, honestly, that what God gave us, the best land that is flowing with everything, we disregard it. We 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 poo poo on it, and we say, "My, the place is not good." What? Which land is better than Africa? Tell me, which land is better than Africa? Where the sun shines twelve hours and the moon shines twelve hours, you can predict your weather. There's no cyclone. There's no uh, holocaust. There's no failure. There's nothing. Anyway, Anthony, before I keep going on and on, please ask your question very briefly. 
so that um, our guests can take as many questions as possible. Okay, uh, good afternoon, everybody. So I have a question and a, and a statement. What do you think about restructuring? Because Nigeria is a very complex compound, if you want to put it that way, very, very complex in all that directions. And one of the ways that we could accelerate progress is to reduce this beast called Abuja, you know, where everybody, like Fela said, Ajuba, if you reverse the words, it becomes Ajuba, you know, so that, you know, we're not the same civilization. I mean, I'm old enough to know that. We're not even close to being the same civilization. And that's not like it's a bad thing. What it means is you have to let everyone go at their own pace. I mean, I can't imagine anybody now in the world trying to hold me back, given what I've put for myself. If I want to eat Gary and Epa, let me enjoy my Gary and Epa. If you want to eat jollof fries and Ogufi, knock yourself out. You follow me? So the restructuring is one of the fastest ways we can accelerate our progress as a country. What do you think about it? Secondly, uh, with respect to elections, you know, one of the problems with democracy is this. Democracy assumes a very powerful assumption that you're dealing with civilized people. This is an unwritten rule about democracy. That if you wanted to read the American Constitution, for example, you could go like this. We, the Americans, haven't known that this system of government cannot work for the uncivilized, have decided to live such and such, and that's how it goes. So in the case of Nigeria, we have too many literates all over the place. So that if you have a professor, a civilized person, an advanced, anybody, whatever, you're not educated, one person on the street can cancel your vote, no matter who you are. So the restructuring for me, which I know will work very quickly, is like I said about Zamfara, let the gold in Zamfara be used to develop Zamfara to Dubai, so that Zamfara can become our Dubai very quickly. And that's what I'm trying to say. So if you restructure all these big companies in the world, trillion dollar companies, Google, Amazon, Facebook, Uber, and so on, they did not sell a drop of oil. They used their brains. These are the richest that work trillions of dollars, just based on the share of wealth in New York. They used their brains, trillions of dollars. These, com these small boys in their 20s. So when I came to America, they, were, they, they had no companies here like that. So restructuring, even if you had no resources, train your people to use their brains. You can be like Google, Uber, Amazon, and so on and so forth. So what do you think about restructuring? Thank you. Um, it's, thank you very much. Um, I, I'm, I'm passionate about the issue of restructuring. Um, there has been attempts to put all sort of confusion in that space. They will say, oh, define what restructuring is. Uh, let's first of all do this, let's first of all do that. But the reality is, um, we, we can take it from several dimensions. I, I, will, I will take it from a, an economic perspective, and then I will come to, to, to political. From an economic perspective, um, I, I have reviewed revenues in Nigeria for, for some years. And you'll be amazed at how you have states in Nigeria that depend on the on Abuja for 88% of what they spend. So every month they send their commissioner to finance to Abuja. He goes and comes back with some billions. And that is what they live on. As a state, they themselves cannot gather 15% of what they spend. Now, the money from Abuja, where does it come from? Four oil states. Every other person is the marginal producer. Maybe by the time you put them together, they will give us like 5% of the rest. So like 95% of our oil comes from four states. Then you have some tax states that are big in taxes. Incidentally, apart from Lagos and Okun, you also have some of these same oil states being the tax states as well because of the location of the oil companies in those states. So the remaining states have largely leaned on these other states. So it's like having an engine with uh, 37 cylinders and only seven of those cylinders are working. You're not going to have efficiency. So Nigeria as currently structured is a suboptimal entity. 
And it is not likely to get out of the woods unless it's restructured such that you can begin to rev the engine. You can turn all the turbines. We can have 37 turbines turning at the same time instead of seven turning and the remaining 30 leaching or leaving on those seven that are charged. Restructuring will have helped us with that. I will also go from a political side. I will, I will go back to uh, America. For the first 32 years of America's democracy, all the presidents uh, for, for 28 out of those 32 years, all the president came from one state only. And it wasn't a problem in America. Then when you think about the fact that Bush senior was president, Bush junior became president. Jeff Bush also wanted to become president, but it wasn't an issue in America. Why? Because what turns the turbines of America at least from an economic perspective and the average citizen, it's not just that man that is sitting at the center. So if to an average American, it doesn't matter where the president comes from. If all they care, it can come from anywhere. That is why they will tolerate three members of the same family trying to be president in America. In Nigeria, you can't even try that. And that is because there is so much power that resides at the center. In, in, in Nigeria. It is where all the money is shared. It is where they determine how many people live in which states in Nigeria. Um, even in the time pass, it is probably where they even deliver the, you know, you know the, 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 the vote. Thank God for uh, gradual improvement in that, in the, in the electoral process. So what restructuring will help, help to do is to take some of these powers that are currently residing at the center, take it back to the constituent unit. And with this, we can begin to unleash the constituent unit such that it's as if we now have 37 turbines turning instead of seven. Seven powering 37. When we can have 37 powering 37, we need to think about it. Restructuring is the way to go. This entity, as it is currently, is suboptimal. It will not be an easy game because there are people who are loving it as it is. And they will fight tooth and nail to ensure that we cannot move into that space of restructuring. Thank you very, very much. Uh, let me go to Kofo. Kofo Koka, I think, has a question. Kofo, unmute yourself, please. Yes, uh, good afternoon, uh, Mr. Lodjade. Um, I have uh, two things to say. One is that uh, I agree with you on the copy and paste attitude that we have. I wonder if you have um, some suggestion or some reasons of um, how uh, we like copy and paste behavior. Uh, my second one uh, has to do with uh, the video of uh, Ms. Sokonjo Iwela. Uh, she mentioned that there are about 143 companies that claim subsidy in Nigeria. Um, I add to that list another maybe 5,000 politicians that are beneficiary of this. We have EFCC, we have some other people. What is stopping us from publishing the names of these companies that are in the subsidy business? Okay, um, thank you very much, Mark. Um, I will address the first one on what can we do um, to modify what we have copied and pasted on our system as far as our political system is concerned. There are, there are several things. For example, we do not even have the capacity to fund the kind of, uh, of a political bureaucracy that we are, or system that we have created. Can we revisit the bicameral legislature, for example, and ask ourselves, after we have 360 members of, uh, you know, uh, House of Representatives who are representing everybody already, do we need that 109 additional? Or is it the 109 we need to keep and forget about, about the other one? We have issues about, um, this I even enshrined in the Constitution, things about uh, every state must give you a minister. Why, why must every state give you a minister? Why, why do I need... Uh, um, 
30, 30 something minutes, 37 ministers yeah, in, in a cabinet. These are things that it, 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 it is not man for law. It is law for man. And anything that is not working for us, nothing stops us from going to that space and changing it. So I am hoping that we'll have uh, a leadership that will have the guts to face some of these very difficult uh, uh, issues. Uh, to, to a certain extent, the current government actually confronted a few of these things uh, in the space of empowerment when it did um, try to give autonomy, financial autonomy to the judiciary and also to uh, at the state legislature levels. Um, even the local government autonomy as well. But we have seen how that has also been resisted within the system. As far as I'm concerned, whatever we need to do, like I said, it is law for man, not man for law. Whatever is constraining us from being able to implement all these changes, let's go into that. If it is legal, let's go into the space and change the law. But it might require people who have convictions to be able to make some of this modification. Then on the, on the subsidy claim, um, there, was a, there was a time that I think some names have been in the media uh, that were published at some point. And then some of these people are even taken to the courts. Uh, some were prosecuted. Just that um, typical of that kind of a situation. We never resolve fully most of the cases and they have gone cold. They have gone literally cold. Those that are not cold are probably just still there in the system. We will continue to litigate on them for the next 10 years as the case may be. We'll never get to the bottom of it. And the, the problem is when people steal too much money, when people have access to a lot of funds, they can frustrate the judicial system. They can keep a case in that system for decades if they want to, which is why we must move away from trying to catch thieves after they have stolen, to make it as difficult as possible for them to steal in the first instance. If we have not created a, a system like the subsidy system that let them be able to take all this money, then we probably will not be talking about this. But we created that system they saw it, they latch on to it, they make billions, and they're still making billions. And we created a system. So let's move away from trying to catch people who have stolen and relocate the point of corruption fight, at least 80% of it, to prevention rather than curative. Thank you very much, Ireti Omo Boriowo. Let's hear your question. Good evening, everybody. Uh, Mr. Olutede, good evening to you. Good evening. I sir. think I recognize your voice as a child on my classic FM. Yes, sir. Yes. Yes. Now, <laughs> when we should look at other some other countries that have that are like third world like us and that have uh, a similar kind of. Uh, uh, oil resources look at a country like venezuela do you know and how yeah. they have gone about their own um you know activities you know because a lot of what we're talking about today it boils down to mismanagement you know where's the oil coming from niger delta well, at least up till now, because they've developed, they've found something in Bauchi or whatever, but up till recently, uh, those are all, all coming from, from Niger Delta. When you travel to that place, look at the state of the place. Because to be honest, I, I, everything, the, the oil we sell on a daily basis is not as much as the oil that is stolen on a daily basis. <laughs> you know? True. So the whole thing has. There's so much rigmortis in the whole thing, and Niger Delta, you cannot expect them to 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 to, to be the, the area where they're pumping them, and the place is so undeveloped. You know, we have to get our thinking right. So, you know, as far back as the 1980s, someone had approached me in London that uh, 
he can get OPL, oil prospecting license. And so, you know, I think during the Babangida regime, they had started giving out oil prospecting license to, to, to individuals and companies. Originally, in, in the 70, early 70s, the only person that had an oil was uh, Adu Ibrahim, the man from Kwara State, the Kwara King. You know, but the whole thing has been so disorganized. That, so, to be honest with you, I think our mental orientation has a lot to do because if if the Niger Delta was 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 a decent place and everything to visit and everything, and you are not just just you know just milking them dry because they're, they're squeezing blood out of them more or less. You know, so, so hard. So what are you suggesting? This all, all, you, all, this or Mr. All, Fadam, all, all, what are you? Yeah, let, let me and uh, let me finish. So what I'm saying is that. Is, is, this, is it a blessing to us or a curse? Because if that's the only thing we're producing and you now want to throw it on the market that people have to pick, I mean, what's the benefit of being in Nigeria? God bless you, sir. <laughs> thank, thank you very much, Sam. Um, it's, it's, um, it's an interesting perspective you have brought into uh, the discussion. Um, and, and it's also the argument uh, of, of a segment of the people which, which to say, look, so what are we benefiting? Um, on the global petrol price uh, platform, there are about 168 countries on that platform. If you go to global petrol prices, you will see the, the, um, how much a liter of petrol is sold for, at least by today that you have yesterday's uh, price or prices on that uh, platform. You'll be surprised that Nigeria is number 161 out of 168 uh, on price. So only seven countries in the world, in fact, only six countries out of 168 sells PMS cheaper than Nigeria. Only seven, only six out of 168. So, um, and some of these, uh, some of these uh, countries that sell cheaper than us, they can actually afford it. We cannot afford it. One of them is Kuwait, for example. So you have Kuwait, uh, you have a country like, uh, um, I think Iran on that, you have Venezuela as well. Why can they afford it? Nigeria has um, an understanding of how rich it is in oil. And, we may be carrying it too far. Number one, Nigeria does not feature on the list of number one to 10 oil producers in the world. Nigeria's name is not there. Number two, by the time you convert Nigeria's oil production to per capita basis, Nigeria is about number 40 in per capita oil production in the world. So we may even need to reduce, be modest about uh, how we found how much oil we produce as, 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 as a country. On per capita basis, we're nowhere, number 40 there, but that's, that's how we rank in the world. So if we also look around us, um, Nigeria has more or less been financing other countries if for consumption by virtue of selling what we are selling right now. It's an advantage. Um, somebody might argue that why can't we uh, let the custom do their work and ensure that nobody can carry uh, fuel out of Nigeria. But I'm, I'm not so sure how that is going to work. So today, because oil is about 450 in Ghana, or thereabout, um, if I can get fuel from Nigeria, where it is 165 to Ghana, I know I'm going to make a lot of money. I know I'm going to make money if I take it to Cotonou, if I take it to Chad or anywhere I take it to around Nigeria, I am going to make a lot of money. And, 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 and that is why we are, as, we, as are today, we are financing, we are subsidizing not just Nigeria, but also some of the consumption that are happening around, around us in Nigeria. We need to get out of that space. I have a strong conviction that what Nigeria needs is not cheap fuel to ride their cars on bad roads. Rather, have a, 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 a moderately priced uh, fuel and get better road 
to ride your vehicles on. What Nigeria need is not a chief well to put in the Abeta Pass My Neighbor Generator at his backyard. What he needs is proper light coming out from the right source so that he doesn't even need that Abeta Pass My Neighbor Generator. How the leadership will, will, will you know, enlist the support of the people to be able to do this is what is left because honestly, the fear of the people is that leadership has not shown enough transparency or honesty. They don't believe that these things will happen. So if they can fix that, it, it will help so that we can shift the, the focus away from don't remove subsidy and take that focus to how can we ensure that when you remove this subsidy, it will translate to a better Nigeria or, or, or to a better infrastructure, both transport infrastructure and power infrastructure for us as Nigeria. Let's shift that discussion towards that. All right, thank you very much. We'll take a last question from Mr. Debayo and then we will close. After that question, please, I have just one question for you or two. That is, if you were president of Nigeria, what will you do about this oil subsidy? And then number two, what should you do about transforming our nation and taking it to where it should be? And then we'll take your closing comments. So you can answer my questions last after Mr. Adibayo has asked his own question. Mr. Adibayo, please. Good evening, um, Pastor Itwa, and um, good evening, Mr. Olajade. Thank you. Um, it's not really a question. Sorry. It's not really a question. It's, um, it's about this subsidy that we are discussing. You cannot have a subsidy when you don't have working refineries. That's number one. You must have working refineries to subsidize. If you want to subsidize a product that you are producing in your country, you must be able to refine it in Nigeria. Now, people are taking this crude oil, they're taking it out to Europe at the European price and the American price, the world market price. And then they are bringing the refined product back into Nigeria. Mm -hmm. How do you want to subsidize? It can work. Your currency is not stable. The exchange rate is not favorable. So it doesn't work. So all that subsidy is just a scam that the leadership is doing all over. All the presidents, they're all involved. And all those people that are involved in uh, uh, all the energy companies, I don't want to mention any particular name. They know what is going on. Your refineries must work before you can have subsidy for your people and to fix your country and make life easier for your people and stop them from trying to leave the country. That is, that is the main, um, um, main thing that must be done. In Saudi Arabia, they subsidize things. They can subsidize their fuel because their refineries are working. So you can determine your internal price. Say, okay, I have this product. I will sell it to my people at this price. I'm not selling to them at the world market price. But what we are doing now, we are now taking the oil out. We go and refine it. We have refineries that we can fix. Those refineries in Portacot, uh, Wari, and Kaduna, they can be repaired. A refinery is not a car. Even if it's a car, all you have to do is bring the experts, let them come and bring the, the necessary equipment and uh, uh, machineries as spare parts that they need and upgrade it. And they can function. So everything that they are doing is just a sabotage because of people want to make foreign exchange and keep money abroad and go and live the La Grande V life, living a very lovely life outside the country. That's what they are just interested in. They're not interested in Nigeria. They just want to come and make Nigeria a place where they make money and then they take the money to Dubai or take it to London or take it to Paris. I don't want to do that. I have spoken on the television for so many years. I've written so many articles. But once they've seen my own stand, nobody wants to support you because they say you are going against the tide. But that is the only way to fix Nigeria. If everybody wants to just go there and then make money and get out of the country, the country cannot be fixed. The uh, lecturers are asking for extra salaries every now and then. What is causing it is the economic management of this, of the of, of, of the uh, of, of Nigeria, the way they, they are managing the economy, including the central bank, the way they devalue the currency, the way they have devalued the money. If we devalue and people ask for extra salaries within a couple of months, if you devalue again, then we are back to the same thing. People are back on strike. They start striking again. So there is no subsidy you can give your, your country unless you have the refineries. So you can determine, okay, I want to send my crude oil to my own people. I can sell it at two naira if I want. It's my product. 
If I even like, I can give it for free. And I will only be exporting the one I want to export to make money. The one for the country that was Gaddafi was doing in Libya. He was subsidizing everything for his people because they had the oil, they had the refineries, and they had the money. So the oil was going out. And when those stubborn European countries were trying to meddle in his affairs, he will starve, he will starve them of, uh, of crude, which would now up the price. So it's, it's, it's how you have to understand international politics. Many of these things, uh, President Jonathan didn't understand it. And um, I don't, I was, I, I, I even felt that uh, when he was there, the situation of the uh, pollution in the Delta became worse. It became okay, worse you. at the end thank of the you, day. Sir. It became worse. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Adebayo. Yeah, please. Um, let, me, let me quickly um, comment respond on Respond to that and the closing remarks and my questions. Uh, he, he had said uh, there was, there is no subsidy. There is indeed subsidy. Uh, and I'm saying it from the perspective of uh, someone who at some point was in that industry. I was group chief operating officer for an indigenous oil company in Nigeria. And I can tell you as a matter of fact that there is subsidy and the subsidy is easy. By the time you bring your fuel, the amount you will have loved to sell it, don't mention you cannot sell it, you sell it at an amount that is lower. So somebody pays you that difference and you go away. That is the subsidy and it exists. Um, he had also mentioned about how because we don't have a refinery uh, is why America is the top producer in the world. Um, I think about 12 million barrels a day. Um, America has subsidy, but it's not at the fuel pump. It's not at the pump. Uh, the subsidy are planted uh, in a, a way up in the chain. And the fuel price, PMS price in America, as at the end of November, is an equivalent of about 405 naira. So, and they have mega refineries there. So it's not a matter of the fact that you have mega, once you have refineries, your fuel will be automatically cheap. That's not how it works. If it is so, America with all these uh, mega refineries should not be selling fuel at a price of 405 Naira. The cost of the pump price of PMS in Saudi Arabia is higher than Nigeria. And Saudi Arabia is, uh, literally has it like a pipe flowing anywhere. The three top producers in the world, US, Russia, and Saudi Arabia, the pump price of, of fuel is higher than Nigeria. And Nigeria is not even on the list of the top 10 producers. So we must begin That's to, you know, so I, I think um, we must ask, ask ourselves what we have done that has not worked for us for 40 years or more. Should we stick to it or be willing to do something else? Because this subsidy regime, has benefited a few people who have seen it as uh, an avenue to make us right, and they have continued to make us right. However, you pointed at the issue of refineries. There is a refinery, private refinery coming up, which is the Dangote refinery. It is the largest single refinery in the world. Apart from that, I am of a strong opinion that we must also make the government refinery to work. Otherwise, will be creating a monopoly. Though government has gone in there to say they are also investing uh, in the Gote refinery to become a co-owner, but I still believe we need more than one indigenous refinery. It helps the price, it helps competition. In fact, we need an antitrust law in Nigeria to help all these uh, monopolies that we tend to create all around. A, a, a law that focuses on competition. We need something like that in Nigeria. Then the, uh, I will talk about the last uh, comment from Pastor Itua. He said, uh, if I were to be the president, um, how will I approach this uh, first subsidy matter? It has taken six years uh, for this administration to get to this point. And what eventually helped to get to this point was the inevitable. We, we finally summoned the courage to pass the PIB. And some of the consequences of that um, we, involves the fact that we need to deregulate. For, for so long, we've stifled investment into that space by not passing that law. Now that we have it, we must resist the temptation to kick the can down the road again. And that temptation is to say, oh, let's, uh, let's be managing it till uh, another 12 months before we... If we dare do that, it will not be 12 months we are waiting for. It will be another six or seven years. Because the new political person that will be coming in will not touch subsidy until 
He has done a first time, he has won a second time, and he's on his way out. That is when he will think of talking subsidy. He has serious political implication, and no politician will go there until that time. Rather than say, don't do it, we should look for how can we do it in such a way that it translates to benefit to the people. Uh, that, that, that is um, what I have to say, but I, I can't remember the last uh, uh, what would you do if you were president of Nigeria to transform our nation? To transform our nation. We, we are a nation not lacking in vision. Uh, I think the current one now uh, is the one they call Vision 2050, which is meant to get uh, is it 100 million Nigeria out of poverty. We've had Vision 2020. We've had 20, we had 2010. There was 2000, this was Vision 2000. But it's not just about uh, the documents is about a disciplined execution. Uh, in certain areas, this administration did that when it comes to uh, completing certain projects that have been abandoned or started way back, uh, which they are, they are bringing into um, materialization. Those things are, but there is a lot to be done. And my focus, if I were president of Nigeria, is in number one, vision, vision that will carry the people along. The people must know where you are taking them to. And then the execution discipline, to be able to say, these are the things we said we were gonna do. This is when we said we were gonna do them. Let's do them and arrive at the, that junction. Once we're able to do that, you will build trust. And that trust capital is very important for people to continue to follow you and help you to deliver whatever you seek to deliver. Without trust, which is what is lacking in the political space, there'll be very little anybody can do. So vision, uh, uh, carrying people along with the vision and then execution discipline that will build trust with the people uh, will, will be the, my focus as a, as a president. Salud, Jede. Thank you so much. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord strengthen you, continue to give you wisdom and continue to make you one of the bastions that will help to build this great and wonderful nation, Nigeria. Thank you for your time. I want to thank everybody that has been on the platform today. Thank you for spending this time with us on the platform. We'll be back same time next week at five o'clock to take on yet another set of issues that concern Nigeria. And I'll be having a very, very interesting guest who hopefully will be in from the US to try and speak to us on these matters. Mr. Oloyeje, there's a job waiting for you to drive <laughs> the fourth force. So you. when you're ready, we'll send you your employment letter. Thank no, you no so much. No a full ground. ground. In full ground. ground. We must make this thing work. We must make it work. We must look for somebody to take us to where we're going. Thank you very much. Warm regards to the I family. Pleasure. God yes, bless sir. you all. Thank you. Yes, sir. Okay, Tua. How are you? Thank you so much. God bless you all. Okay. Thank you, Auntie Kofo. God bless you. God Thank bless you, you too. God bless you for being there. Good evening, Pastor. Good evening. Good evening, everybody. God bless you. Good evening. Good evening, Pastor.